Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture that's going to take us to the end of the unit on the anthropology of medicine or medical anthropology. And we're also going to pick up and start the next uh, unit on the anthropology of gender and sexuality. So very briefly, we already discussed in class the ways in which medical anthropologists are able to push back against or critique Western biomedicine. In other words, the way that we think about health and illness and disease in the West. And we ended with a description of this term medicalization. That's the process through which we come to, uh, we meaning uh, Western scientists, um, come to create a term for various human conditions. They medicalize human suffering. This is not to say that medicalization in that is necessarily good or bad. It's just to say that it's a complicated cultural process. The example I gave was of PMS, right? The idea is that um, this becomes a category a condition through which women can understand their physical symptoms prior to menstruation. But before the 1960s, it didn't exist as a condition. The medical authorities didn't recognize it as a particular, particular medical uh, condition. So on the one hand, it kind of medicalizes, objectifies human experience and suffering, which can be problematic. But at the same time, it helps to remove certain forms of stigma around, say, the experiences of what we now know as PMS. As I mentioned, I just wanted to provide a trigger warning to the next um, case study medicalization, we are gonna be talking, or I'm going to very briefly be touching upon in the videos we watch, we'll touch upon um, the issue of, of sexual abuse. So earlier this semester, not that long ago, we watched a short clip from the Oprah show on a woman who is experiencing or lives with dissociative identity disorder. If you remember, I noted that uh, that is the former, uh, well, I should say the former term uh, used for this condition was multiple personality disorder, but we now um, use the term dissociative identity disorder. In 1980, the idea of multiple personality disorder is officially born when in the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, known as the DSM, those of you who are psychology, uh, majors or minors might know what I'm talking about. Um, that is when the American Psychiatric Association, this medical board of medical authorities in, in the field of psychiatry come to say, we have discovered or we are claiming that this is a new and particular kind of condition. Now, one thing we already did when we watched that video was we were comparing it to how spirit possession works in Madagascar, right? In both contexts, you have a human, an individual, who is inhabited by multiple persons in a sense, right? In dissociative identity disorder, this is a very troubling um, um, human experience, right? It is something that is seen as, as negative, as something that needs to um, require some sort of therapeutic treatment or medicalization of some kind. Whereas in Madagascar, instead one harnesses, one in fact celebrates and um, regulates the various persons that come to be within themselves. Of course, these are very different cultural contexts. These are very different experiences, right? Spirit possession in Madagascar is again, spirits by former um, kings and queens and reigning, you know, formerly reigning monarchs. But nevertheless, this gives us some sense of, of kind of how to compare these two situations. Now, cases of multi, a multiple personality disorder skyrocketed in the 1980s and 90s. And this is how it came to start to be you know, understood as, as a thing, as a problem. What's fascinating about multiple personality disorder, as it was then known, is that there were less than 12 documented cases of it from between 1922 and 1972. But by 1986, there were 6,000 newly diagnosed patients across the US by the early 1900s, excuse me, by the early 1990s, there were hundreds of cases in any, name any regional center in the US like Hampton Roads. And there were entire private institutions and hospitals that were constructed 
for those persons claiming to suffer from multiple personality disorder. Now, those um, who often were, were determined to have multiple personality disorder were usually those who um, either themselves claimed or psychiatrists claimed that these individuals experienced sexual abuse during their childhood, some form of trauma related to sexual abuse. I say that sometimes the patient didn't even say this because sometimes the psychiatrist read into that person's experience that they probably experienced sexual abuse, but that they'd repressed it so strongly that they couldn't even themselves as the patient articulate it. So part of why multiple personality disorder, now known as dissociative identity disorder, is so complex is that it's also couched in the language of morality and justice, right? If we are to understand these persons as having experienced sexual abuse, obviously this kind of uh, therapy is meant to, to out that wrong, right? Which can never, of course, be fixed. But that's, that's I mean, that's, that is psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis, that's psychiatry more generally, right? The idea is to kind of express one's um, issue as a form of therapy. Now, let's talk about the cultural context, right? I just said that it's really not until the 1980s that wham, all of a sudden, multiple personality disorder is born. It's a thing, it's something where, again, entire hospitals are being built to confront this issue. This is coming out of a particular context in the US in the 1980s and 1990s. This is actually something that will sound very familiar to those of us, well, to all of us today um, here in the United States. There was an increasing liberal versus conservative divide in American political life. And this really started in the 1980s and 1990s. And part of that on the part of the religious right was this idea that, um, that the United States had lost or was losing um, a sense of morality across the country. Now, here's where things take a creepy turn. And, it's, it's um, noteworthy that, of course, this is coming so close to, to the holiday of Halloween. But satanic ritual abuse came to be understood as a leading cause of multiple personality disorder. So it was both sexual trauma and abuse and therefore trauma during childhood. But often the idea was that this sexual abuse was done at the hands of those who worship Satan devil worshiping cults and communities in the US. No, I am not making this up. So I'd like you to watch two clips. These are both included in the um, in a folder on Blackboard. First is what was the satanic panic? And the second is a, a very long documentary from Frontline. It's like an hour long, I think. I only want you to watch the first 10 minutes. So go pause this now and go watch those two clips. Okay, now that you have watched those two clips, you have a sense of the very complicated cultural and political landscape that the US was experiencing in the late 80s, well, in the 80s and into the early 90s. So you can see this is a complicated terrain, right? It's not that everyone thought that multiple personality disorder was a thing you had people who were criticizing those psychiatrists who supported patients who identified as living with multiple personality disorder. So others, for example, claimed that MPD was pushed by these psychiatrists who profited, of course, from, from this new therapeutic economy. Right? They were making money off the fact that they had patients, they had a string of patients who needed really intensive care and therapy. And then, of course, there were, was the tabloid and media outlets that were sensationalizing this condition, including, you know, picture, um, uh, portraits of those living with MPD on, on the uh, Oprah show, among other places. So I'm going to stop this here and we'll continue with part two of the lecture.